So this will be the second lecture out of chapter 18. Uh, <clears throat> so aldehydes and ketones. So in this chap uh, lecture, we'll look at uh, some of the reactions that aldehydes and ketones undergo. So that's what we'll do for the ne this lecture and the next two. So lots of reactions of aldehydes and ketones to learn. <clears throat> so we've already learned several reactions of aldehydes and ketones. So let's review the ones we have covered so far. So we've looked at how aldehydes and ketones reduce. So if you remember sodium borohydride uh, with an aldehyde or a ketone, we'll reduce that to an alcohol. All right, sodium borohydride, source of H minus, which goes there. And O minus picks up a proton from methanol. And there were three other ways, two other ways that we looked at how to reduce aldehydes and ketones. So if you remember those other reagents, so lithium aluminum hydride, oops, followed by uh, some acid workup stuff. We'll do the same thing. <clears throat> or you can use H2 and some metal catalyst like rainy nickel to add. So each of these just add hydrogen or hydrogen across a double bond. So we've looked at, so those are all org, um, organic one reactions out of chapter 10. And then this semester we've looked at <clears throat> a couple of ways to reduce ketones, um, reducing all the way down to CH2. So um, zinc, mercury, HCl, the Clemenson reduction, or the wolf kirchner reduction. Right, hydrazine and KOH. And then these reactions would have been from organic one as well, chapter 10. So synthesis of alcohols. So if you remember the Grignard reaction, that carbon's partial negative, that goes there. That becomes O minus, which picks up a hydrogen in the second step. All right, so whatever's attached to magnesium, attach it to the carbon that had the oxygen. So you would make that tertiary alcohol in this case, or organolithium reagents, same, carbon's partial negative, so carbon goes there. And the C double one O becomes an alcohol. So you would make that, right? Make the carbon carbon bond. Okay, so those are the reactions we've already seen. So you've already seen one, two, three. Uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different reactions of aldehydes and ketones. And in this chapter, we'll cover, cover several more. <clears throat> okay, um, so first we'll look at the relative reactivity. Um, so aldehydes in general are more reactive than ketones. And for a couple of reasons, one a steric reason and one an electronic reason. So it's important to recognize first that carbon's partial positive, right? Because oxygen's more electronegative, so oxygen's partial negative. So then this carbon of the carbon oxygen double bond is susceptible to nucleophilic attack. So some nucleophile that's partial negative or fully negative will be attracted to that carbon. So the less sterically crowded that carbon is, the more susceptible it will be to a nucleophilic attack, and the more partial positive that's on that carbon, the more susceptible it will be to nucleophilic attack. Okay, so this will be a, so we'll use this reaction with water to illustrate uh, the difference in reactivity between aldehydes and ketones. So since that carbon's partial positive and that's partial negative, you, oxygen's partial negative, if you react it with water, take a lone pair of electrons on oxygen, make a bond to that carbon, you can't put five bonds on carbon, so you have to break a bond. So let's take the C double bond O, take those two pi electrons and break the bond by moving those electrons on the oxygen as a lone pair. And then that would give you this. And then in the next step, lose a hydrogen from oxygen. So those electrons become a lone pair on oxygen. And that oxygen that's a negative will pick up a hydrogen. So you just lost a hydrogen, so that oxygen can pick that hydrogen up. 
and now you make this where carbon has two OHs on it. That's what's called a hydrate, or it's also called a gem diol. So that would be a C with two OH on it. So that would be a hydrate or a gem diol. Gem means they're on the same carbon. Okay, so if you did this reaction with formaldehyde, then you, if you put formaldehyde in water, you make about almost 100% of the hydrate. So formaldehyde is very reactive. If you use acetaldehyde instead, you only get about 50% of the hydrate. And if this is your aldehyde, so obviously there's a steric effect here. This is bulky. Then, um, I don't think that's right. I gotta check that number. That number is probably not right. And my notes are not here, so. We should say that's the wrong number. It's it should be less than fifty percent. And if you went to acetone instead, so now you have um, two R groups. So that's going to provide that's going to make a steric effect, and that's going to decrease the reactivity of the carbon oxygen double bond as well. And so now you only make 0.14% of the hydrate. So in this case, they're equilibria, so the equilibria would greatly lie towards the left, whereas in this case, the equilibria would greatly lie towards the right. Okay, so there's both the steric and electronic effect. Uh, so this carbon's partial positive, and partial positive, and partial positive, but alkyl groups are electron releasing. So you could think of this like a methyl carbocation, a primary carbocation, and a secondary carbocation. Right, methyl groups release electron density, so that's going to be an electronic effect that's going to decrease so formaldehyde will have a larger partial positive on carbon because there's nothing to help stabilize that with the oxygen removing the electron density and acetone will have less partial positive charge there and then there's also a steric effect. From the two methyl groups. So for that reason, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. So when partial positive on carbon goes down, the partial positive on carbon goes down when it's substituted with alkyl groups. So that's the electronic effect. And then alkyl groups impose a steric effect, making shielding the carbon of the carbon oxygen double bond making it less acceptable to nucleophilic attack. So ketones you can see some, an electronic or steric effect as well so this would illustrate an electronic effect so if we took CH3 and replaced it with CF3 well fluorines of course are very partial or very electronegative the most electronegative atom in the periodic table so they're going to pull electron density off of carbon and that's going to make that carbon very partial positive. So the hexafluoroacetone is about 100% of the hydrate form in water, whereas acetone is only about 0.14%. Okay, so oftentimes these reactions of aldehydes and ketones to speed them up, they're often acid or base catalyzed. So let's go through the basic mechanism, how acid and base catalysis works. So how do you know if it's acid or base catal catalyzed? Well, if you see H plus in the reaction, with in the first part of the reaction, right? Not the second part of the reaction, like, like here, right? If it's in the first part of the reaction, then it's gonna be an acid catalyzed reaction. So um, how does that work? Well, oxygen is partial negative, so it's going to be attracted to an acid. So take a lone pair of electrons on oxygen and make a bond of hydrogen. And now oxygen is partial positive. All right, how did that, how is that going to speed the reaction up? Well, we can draw a resonance structure of this, right? Take these two electrons moving on oxygen. And so that we can delocalize that positive to carbon. So a full positive on carbon. 
is going to make that more attracted to a nucleophile, and so that's going to speed the reaction up. So now take a lone pair on the nucleophile, make a bond to that carbon, and that would give you this intermediate, and then lose a hydrogen. So those electrons come off, the OH electrons become a lone pair on oxygen, and now you have your hydrate. And you've got H plus back, so you use H plus in the first step to get the reaction going. And then you got H plus back at the end, so the H plus, so the acid is not consumed in the reaction, but it does speed the reaction up, so that makes the H plus just a catalyst in the reaction. So you don't need a lot of acid, you just need a few drops if it's something like acetic acid or something like a sulfonic acid solid, just put a little bit of the solid acid into the reaction. Okay, so it can be base catalyzed as well. So how do you know it's a base? So something like hydroxide is a base, if that's in the first parts of your reaction. So the mechanism is different. So that carbon is partial positive. Now you're introducing something that's negative. So the carbon's going to react first instead of the oxygen. So take a lone pair on oxygen, make a bond to that carbon, and break the double bond. And that oxygen becomes negative. So now take a lone pair of electrons on oxygen, make a bond to hydrogen from water, and then you reform hydroxide. And now you have your hydrate. You reformed hydroxide, so that makes hydroxide not consumed in the reaction. Um, how did it speed the reaction up? Because hydroxide is a better nucleophile. Than if you just had water. So that first step is going to go faster than if it was water attacking there. But you get hydroxide back at the end, so it's not consumed, so that makes it catalyst so it's a base catalyzed reaction okay so hopefully you understand the mechanistic aspects but always you should be able to just predict products relatively easily if you learn the recipe so aldehyde or a ketone with H plus and water is just going to make a hydrate so just take that C double one O and make two OH's there instead right or aldehyde or a ketone and Hydroxide and water, again, just make the hydrate. So take that C double bond O and put two OH, two OH groups there instead. And now you have the hydrate. Okay, so that's your first new reaction in this chapter is making hydrates. And second new reaction, if you take an aldehyde or a ketone with HCM, then you make this molecule. So you have a carbon uh, that's got an OH and a CN on it. That's a new functional group that's called a cyanohydrin. So how does this work? Well, oxygen's partial negative, carbon's partial positive, hydrogen's partial positive. Um, so hydrogen, so it's slightly acidic, HCN is. So oxygen takes hydrogen, and then you make CN minus. And then the CN minus now that was formed in that step is a nucleophile, so CN attacks here, and those electrons become a lone pair on oxygen. And now you have OH and CN on the same carbon, so that's a cyanohydrin. So it's the same fundamental mechanism most of these mechanisms are, right? Like the usually it's ace cat acid catalyzed, so protonate the oxygen and then nucleophile attacks the carbon-oxygen double bond. So this is a somewhat dangerous reaction to do because HCN is a toxic and deadly gas. And so gases are difficult to work with because you have to plumb them right through, through lines. And if it's toxic or deadly gas, then, then obviously that presents a major lab hazard. So there's a much safer way to do this reaction, and that's to use sodium cyanide instead, which is a solid. So easier to put a solid into your reaction than to put a gas into your, your reaction. And once you have the CN in your reaction, then you add the acid. So this will be a typical recipe. So NaCN followed by an acid like HCO. And ether, water would be a typical solvent system. Okay, so what's gonna happen? So HCl is a strong acid, so H plus Cl minus. So 
So you use HCO as the source of H+. So you put the solid sodium cyanide in, and then you put the HCO in. So protonate the oxygen from the HCO, and then CM- attacks and breaks the double bond, and now you have your cyanohydrin. So these are synthetically useful because the CN group, as we'll see in later chapters, they can be converted to amines. So you could reduce the nitrile to an amine, or you can hydro do a hydrolysis and you convert the nitrile to a carboxylic acid as well. Okay, so again, if you just learn the recipe and how to predict products, if you have an aldehyde or a ketone NaCnHCl, you're gonna make a cyanohydrin, right? So CN goes here and this becomes an OH and that's your product. Okay, so third new reaction. So if you take an outer outer ketone and react it with an alcohol. So this is a much longer mechanism. So let's let's step through the mechanism. So you have an alcohol and you have an acid catalyst, so H plus. So that's always the first step is protonate the oxygen. So H, oxygen reacts with H plus. And then the second step is nucleophile reacts. So take a lone pair of electrons on oxygen, make a bond of that carbon. And break the double bond. And then lose a the hydrogen from oxygen. And now you have this. So this would be analogous to a hydrate where you have two OHs or a cyanohydrin where you have an OH and a CN. Now you have an OH and an OR on that carbon. And that's a new functional group. That's what's called a hemiacetal. So a carbon with an OH and an OR group on it is called a hemiacetal. <clears throat> so with hydrates and cyanohydrins, it was done at that point. But this doesn't stop at this point, so this can react further. So you can, so you can isolate the hemiacetal, but it's not easy to. Usually it's gonna react further. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna protonate the oxygen again. And then the water molecule that you just made was is going to leave. And you make this carbocation, and that's not a bad place to put a carbocation. Why? Because it's resonance stabilized, right? You can take a lone pair on oxygen and move it down to make a double bond. So you can delocalize that carbocation uh, positive charge onto the oxygen, so that stabilizes it. So that would be one reason why this reaction doesn't stop at the hemiacetal, because once you protonate the oxygen of the OH and make water, it can leave, so this can keep on reacting. <clears throat> okay, so you make this, and then what happens is another molecule of alcohol attacks. So technically you need two alcohol, two equivalents of alcohol. So make a bond from oxygen to carbocation carbon, and then lose a hydrogen. The electrons in the OH bond become a lone pair on oxygen, and then that would be your final product. <clears throat> so that's what's so that's a new functional group. So here you have a carbon with two OR groups on it. That's what's called an acetal. And the side product would be, well, you lost a water molecule at some point, right? So you make the acetal plus water. <clears throat> okay, so that's a long mechanism. So predicting that you can, we can make predicting the product easier if you just learn to recognize the reaction. If you take a aldehyde or a ketone with H plus and alcohol, then basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna lose a molecule of water, so we need two moles of the alcohol and then attach the two OR groups to that carbon instead, and that would be your acetal. <clears throat> or stepwise, right, we're gonna make that into um, an alcohol, and this is going to attach there, so that would be your hemi acetal. And then we're gonna lose the water molecule there, and another one of these is gonna come in and replace it, and then you're gonna have your acetal. <clears throat> right, so just take whatever the alcohol is, the OR group, and attach it to that carbon where the oxygen C double bond O is at. 
So if we predict a product from this reaction, so that carbon where the C double bond O was at, we're gonna have two of the OR groups attached. So whatever the R group is on oxygen is just tagging along. <coughs> so that would be the acetal, or you would initially would have made the hemiacetal, right? Which gets converted into the acetal. <clears throat> okay, so a source of acid. So it could just be a couple of drops of sulfuric acid, for example. Or another acid that's common is p toluene sulfonic acid. So that's the structure where that's your acidic hydrogen. So that's a so just um, a solid. So just put a little bit of a spatula and drop that into your, your reaction, or put a few drops of sulfuric acid. <clears throat> okay, so this next reaction is a version of the same thing. It's just a little bit more complex. So if you notice, in, in this case, we have two alcohols. And you make an acetal, and if you notice in this case, we have two alcohols. They just happen to be in the same molecule. So if they're in the same molecule, what's going to happen is you're going to make a ring. So we'll attach both of those oxygens from the diol, and then they are linked by that CH2-CH2 bridge. So you make a cyclic. cyclic acetal. Huh. So let's go through the mechanism, same mechanism as before. So we protonate the oxygen and then a nucleophile attacks. So take a lone pair on oxygen, make a bond here, break the double bond, and then lose the hydrogen from the oxygen that just attacked and those, those electrons become a lone pair. Okay, and so now we're going to protonate the oxygen of the C double bond O again to make a water molecule. And then the water molecule is going to leave, take those two electrons with it. Now you have a carbocation, which is resonance stabilized. Uh, now the other oxygen is going to attack that carbon. And then we're going to lose the hydrogen attached to that oxygen, and that's going to become a lone pair. So you would make that. Or it would be more commonly drawn right side up. You would make that cyclic acetal. So if you have a, so all of these reactions are reversible. So the side product is water, all right? You lost a water molecule in this step. <clears throat> And there's still acid around because it's just a catalyst. So if you want, so it's it's an equilibrium. So all of these reactions are reversible. So we could go through these steps and backwards, right? Take one of the acetal oxygens and protonate it to get back to here. And then we could open that acetal bond up to get back to here. And then a water molecule could attack the carbocation to get back to here. And then you could lose an oxygen from the water molecule to get back to here. And then what do we need to do? Now we need to pick up a hydrogen on the acetal oxygen to get to there. And then you can remake the carbon oxygen double bond and kick off the diol. And then lose a proton from the oxygen and now you're back to where you started at. So all of these react steps are reversible. So if you wanted this reaction to go forward and shift the equilibria forward, then how could you do that? You could just apply the Chartier's principle from, if you remember that from Gen Chem 1. So as water is formed, you could distill the water off, for example. And if you remove a product, then that shifts the equilibria to more product. Okay, so which of these acetals is easier to form? Um, taking benzaldehyde with two moles of ethanol to make this acyclic acetal or taking benzene with this um, so that would be ethane 
one to diol right or ethylene glycol which is what most people would call it um, so that's a molecule you're all familiar with you may not know it but that's uh, one you probably all use on a daily basis uh, that's what's an antifreeze which is what's in the radiator of your car right to help cool the engine uh, but it also has useful synthetic organic chemistry principle properties <clears throat> as we'll see in the next couple of examples but anyway which of these two acetals is easier to form so this is a principle from organic from general chemistry or two so here we have three molecules right three molecules go to make two molecules here we have two molecules go to make two molecules so which is easier to do uh, two molecules to two molecules is if you remember this uh, word from general chemistry to entropy here in the top one you go from more disorder to order you go from three molecules and you combine those into two molecules so that's a more ordered system so that's a negative entropy whereas here two molecules become two molecules delta s is around zero about no entropy change so entropy uh, becoming or it's more disorder is typically favorable so it's easier to make the cyclic acetal than the acyclic acetal Okay, so what good is this for? So we'll take a tough couple of synthesis examples to illustrate the usefulness of this. So what if you wanted to do this transformation to take this molecule on the left and make this molecule on the right? So you want to reduce the carbon-oxygen double bond ketone, but not reduce the carbon-oxygen double bond of the aldehyde. Well, so you know your reagents. If you want to do a reduction, you could do lithium aluminum hydride. But the problem with this is that aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. So you would reduce the aldehyde before you reduce the ketone, so you couldn't do that. So how do you do that? Is you use what's you use a protecting group. So if we take this molecule and react it with ethylene glycol first, since the aldehyde is more reactive than the ketone, then it will react there and you have now protected the aldehyde because when you do the reduction, the acetal, so that's an acetal, does not react under those conditions. So you can now reduce the ketone without reducing the acetal. And then now that you have the secondary alcohol here, now you can remove Now you can remove the acetal. How do you do that? Uh, you just add acid and water, and then the protecting group will come back off and you remake your aldehyde. And now you've reduced the ketone without reducing the aldehyde. So this is a very common strategy in organic synthesis. A lot of time you have multiple functional groups in a molecule, and if you want one molecule, one functional group to react and not the other functional group, then you may have to protect that functional group. Uh, because a reaction that you want to do may react with both functional groups. So you may have to find a reaction that will only react with one functional group and protect it and then do the reaction with the other functional group and then take the protecting group off. Right. So in this case that, that increased the synthesis step by two steps because you have to put the protecting group on and then remove it but you have no other choice because there's no other way to do that reduction to reduce the ketone without reducing the aldehyde. And so again, if you have the acetal, how do you remove it? it? Is just this, you just reverse out of this process since all of these steps are reversible. So if you added a bunch of water, then by Le Chartier's principle, that would shift the equilibrium back to the reactants. Okay, so this illustrates a, a use of protecting groups again. So if we wanted to do this synthesis, so we want to add benzene rings here uh, but we don't want them to react there so if you want to add these benzene rings then probably at some point you want to do a Grignard reaction but the problem is, is that ketones 
react with grenadine re reagents. So you couldn't just add, you couldn't just do that and get this product because these would react there as well. And you don't want that to happen. So what you have to do first is instead is you have to protect the ketone because the ketone will react with the ethylene glycol preferentially to the ester. So now that the ketone, now that you have the acetal, well the acetals don't react with Grignard reagents. So now you can do the Grignard reaction And if you remember from chapter, well, this will be chapter 10, organic one, then two of these are going to react here, right? One's going to react and knock that off, and then another one's going to react, and this is going to become an OH after it picks up a proton in the second step. So now we've added two benzenes there and we still have the protecting group on and if you want to remove the protecting group then that's just uh, acid hydrolysis so water and acid and now you synthesize the molecule without the ketone reacting okay mm -hmm.